Good evening, everybody, and welcome to another episode of The Guys Who Stare at Stats. I'm Cade Kennedy, joined by Andrew Santangelo. We have a little bit of a different schedule this week, so this is our non-football episode. We'll have an actual football episode later tonight with myself, Connor Gray, and J.D. Eddy. But for now, getting into basketball, baseball, some of what we do, the other sports we cover on the show, as always with my partner, Andrew Santangelo, and asking the most important question of the day, Andrew, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. You know, very busy, very busy day. Hope everybody had a fantastic Labor Day weekend. Enjoyed that extra day off on Monday, uh, if you were able to have off, and you know, ready to dive into this stuff. But, Kate, how you doing? I'm I'm doing well. You know, Dude. had a good trip. Went down to Norman Saturday, saw the Oklahoma UTEP game. Got to enjoy the atmosphere there in Norman. It was a good time. If only it could have been ten degrees cooler. That's the main takeaway from that. But we'll talk about that a little bit later in the show. But I want to get into our main topic that actually, well, happened five days ago. We were off last week. We had a hectic enough week where none of us could be in a room together at the right time. But, of course, stuff had to happen while we were gone, including Donovan Mitchell being traded to the Cleveland Cavaliers. We had been saying Donovan Mitchell to the Knicks is the most likely option. And it's the NBA where anything is possible, and Cleveland able to snap in and get the trade. The official trade is the Cavs sending Lori Markinen, Ochai Abaji, and Colin Sexton three first round picks in 25, 27, and 29, and two pick swaps in 26 and 28 for Donovan Mitchell. So if you're Cleveland, you have your star. You had a young core last year that I thought was pretty good considering where they were. Not really a rebuilding team, trying to get more into a playoff contending team. They were able to do that. Where do they go from here? They've made the big trade. What other moves do they have to make, Andrew? Or is this good for now? Yeah, this is an interesting trade. I, I, We talked about it, and to your point, yeah, the one week, of course, we don't do a show. All this news breaks. I mean, we've been waiting for this trade, it feels like, for three months now, all summer since the NBA draft. (laughs) But... No, it, it's it's an interesting trade, and I, I think this trade right here almost describes, and I'm pulling up their projected starting lineup, but th- this trade almost describes what we were referring to earlier about you have to be careful what you trade for. I don't know how much better the Cavs become in this trade because of what they gave up as well. I mean, let me ask you this question before I dive into the, the extra pieces that were acquired in this deal, but is there really that big of a difference between Donovan Mitchell and Colin Sexton? Outside of maybe the three-point shooting? I mean, Colin Sexton's younger. That's the big thing to me. So, so again, yeah. So, I, I, again, I think these two kind of go hand-in-hand. Hand, and then on top of that, you're giving up Markinen and uh, Agbaji. Like, I don't know. To me, Cavs overpaid here a little bit. I, I get it. I mean, think about all those pieces they gave up. Three unprotected first-round picks, 25, 27, 29, and two pick swaps as well. So... And this is just for Donovan Mitchell, right? Correct if I'm wrong. But yes, this they, is just they, Donovan they Mitchell. Gave up all that for Donovan Mitchell. So if this trade doesn't work out, your future's in jeopardy here. And again, I don't value Mitchell too much higher than Colin Sexton. Is he better? I mean, yeah, he's better. But is he that much better? Where you got to give up two key role players as well and all those picks? I mean, to me, he's not that much better. But, I mean, now the, the expected starting lineup here for the Cavaliers is going to be Darius Garland, Donovan Mitchell, Karis LeVert, Evan Mobley, and Jared Allen. Um, I mean, where does that get you? That's what I'm going to ask you. You just traded all that. And don't get me wrong. Donovan Mitchell is a great player. But you just traded all that, and where is that going to get you? I'm going to say maybe the sixth seed in the East. Yeah, I was about to say the, the best-case scenario, I would say, like you said, Andrew, sixth seed in the East, maybe a 4-5 or five on a really weak year for the East. Yeah. but. We don't really see that in the East anymore. You've got teams that are contending now. Five years ago, this would have been an amazing team to be able to run in the East. But nowadays, with how tough it is over there, they're catching up to the West. I have still believe the West is better, but I believe the Cavs, maybe you get to a second round if you're lucky. But it feels like Donovan Mitchell's going from one position in Utah where he could not get out of the first round. And if he did, something bad had to happen to the Jazz later. That was just kind of the natural law we saw of it to the exact same scenario in Cleveland. No, exactly. That's right. I'm going to ask you this question. And, and as I pull up the final standings from last year, just to see where the Cavs were actually at. 
But I mean, let's just run through real quick. And we don't obviously we're not going to predict records, just uh, records. But yeah, say, we but, still have a but, while till we get to that. Well, let me just ask you this question though. On paper, we'll, we'll run through the standings here. Heat Celtics, who's still better? I, I would say both of them are still better than Cleveland. I mean, who's still better between Miami and Boston? Probably Boston. They won the series. Yeah. So I mean, you have Heat Celtics better than the Cavs. Bucks Cavs. Bucks. Sixers Cavs. Sixers. Raptors Cavs. We're still the Raptors. <laughs> Depends Raptors. on the day for the Raptors, well, though. That's true. But so we're gonna lean Raptors, Bulls, yeah. Cavs, probably the Bulls, Nets, Cavs. Still probably the Nets. I I mean, Hawks. granted, granted, if the Nets play to yeah. their potential, Hawks, Cavs. I, I'd say the Cavs. Okay, so you, based off that, obviously injuries can change everything. Yes, injuries. But can based change off a lot. of that, we're having them jump one spot. Yeah, they were the ninth seed last year. Went forty four and thirty eight. They had a winning record last year without Mitchell. Yeah. And again. You're giving up three, I mean, two pieces, two role players and a starter for one starter. I don't know how much, because I agree. I, the only team maybe, I mean, just because the Raptors are such a weird team, you don't know what you get out of them year for year. Yeah. Maybe you could jump the Raptors and the Hawks. But the Hawks went out and made moves this offseason too. So yeah. I don't necessarily sit here and say Cavs are automatically better than the Hawks. I think exactly. it's, it's still going to be a fight. So I'm going to ask you this question then. Based off of that, are the, can the could the Cavs make this trade and still miss the playoffs? Well, I guess they'll get the playing game at least. Yeah, I was say a few <laughs> years ago, yes. Nowadays, I would think in you know, barring disaster happening, they would get a top ten spot. They would make at least yeah. the play in. But the thing I was gonna ask you is who wins this trade? Because I mean, if you're Cleveland, you got your guy, but now you're in win now mode. If you're Utah Welcome to the rebuild. You can do whatever you want. You have no expectations this year. You have no Gobert. You have no Mitchell. I think Utah won another trade here. I mean, yes, you get all these picks. You get young talent and Margaret and Abaji. You have your star of the future if you want to make him your guy in Colin Sexton. You don't have to deal with Gobert's contract. You don't have to deal with Mitchell's contract. You're in the rebuild. You can do whatever. If you want to tank for Wimbenyama and start building around him, I know we've kind of discussed that on the show before, but I'm I'm never truly I was never the highest guy on Donovan Mitchell in the first place. Yeah, I always think. thought he would be a good number two option, you know, a good number two star, you know, more of a pure scorer, not a big defender, not a big, you know, everything else guy. But my goodness, I I can't say outright that Cleveland made the right move here. No, if they would have got another piece with Mitchell, and they didn't have to get another Donovan Mitchell, but if they yeah. would have got uh uh, another piece here, uh, like, like some of these guys in this deal themselves, then you could maybe have an argument. But no, I, I think I'm with you. On paper, Cavs win this trade. Or, sorry, Jazz win this trade over the Cavs um, for multiple reasons. I, I think you gain young talent, like you already mentioned, Cade. But also, you put yourself here, you can go out and trade. I mean, you got three unprotected first-round picks. You can go out and trade two of those, get another star with Sexton. You're getting pick swaps. Because here, here's the thing, too. The Jazz still aren't going to be that bad of a team. Like, they're still going to fight for the 8, 7, 8 spot. Yeah, and that's the crazy so, thing about it. So, with that being said, these pick swaps might not even mean much because I think they would be pretty close to each other, honestly, and talent-wise. Um, the biggest thing here, the only thing that could hurt the Jazz is Colin Sexton's contract because he's going to be a free agent soon. So, if he's unhappy, that could cause some issues, and maybe he walks. But here's the thing. You're still going to win this trade because in the end, you got three unprotected first-round picks. You got the pick swaps. and, and But that see, that's where the pick swaps kind of confused me in this deal because based off of that, we talked about them being worse or Jazz now have a chance to rebuild. If you're going to really rebuild, why would you want to pick swap with the Cavs who are trying to win? So that, That's the only part of this deal for the Jazz that's a little confused is why are you bargaining for pick swaps? Because you're not like assuming, like you said, okay, this is gonna be a rebuild. You're gonna be top ten. That's hypothetically, to say you're top ten, and then let's say the Cavs get that seven seed, and they got the seventeenth pick. You're not gonna pick swap. My whole guess with that is knowing Danny Ainge, this would be something similar to what he did in Boston, where you acquire assets for the sake of having them. You're not going to use them yet. You're going to trade them for yeah. picks later on down the line. I think with Ainge, I mean, we saw him do this with the Celtics. It wasn't just a two years and we're done. 
it is a continuously evolving process where you are continuing to cycle in and out. And you see even still that happens with Boston. They're still trading and doing. We see with Oklahoma City, they're still trading and doing. And they started this process, you know, of trading Paul George and all of that. It felt like that happened ages ago. There is just so much that happens in the NBA now with trades and free agency and drafting to where it's not just a it's just a whole year round thing basically and picks evolve i mean we're talking about 2028 already that you know <laughs> that's 6 years down the line we don't even know what's going to happen in the you know so much is going to change in that time maybe cleveland has to blow it up by then maybe not it's the long con you're just trying to play it out as long as you can and ride whatever you can but to your point there what pick 2028 and 2029 those draft picks aren't even in high school yet. That's true. <laughs> like, isn't that wild? We 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 don't even know who these people are. Yet. We're just randomly guessing. You know, oh, you know, some seventh grader one day he's going to be involved in this trade. He doesn't even know it yet. Right. It, it's absolutely unbelievable that this stuff happens. Like, just yeah, let's just go ahead. Seven years down the line, you know, who knows? Oh, that's what I love too. I mean, I'm jumping jumping here a little bit. When college football, you get the alert: so and so is playing so and so in 2031. Yeah. I'm like, great. We don't like, even know if that yeah, team's gonna like be good I, or bad. Like when I got a notification, oh, you to schedule Clemson 2035. I was like, I'm glad to know some kindergartner is gonna play in that game. Proud of that kid. Right. Doesn't even know, you know, the entire alphabet yet, maybe, but he's gonna be playing for our team. But moving on to the other NBA signing that happened earlier today, Philadelphia Sixers adding Montrez Harrell or uh, Montrez Harrell. I always want to say Harrell of that darn uh, shacked in a fool sketch <laughs> where he calls him Montrezel Harrell, and it's hilarious to me. So I love saying that wrong. But he, was, I mean, you bring a good guy, sixth man of the year for the nineteen twenty season, played for the Clippers then. He's bounced around, kind of becoming a journeyman of himself, going from the Clippers to the Lakers. Now he makes the jump over to Philadelphia. So, as our local Sixers fan, Andrew, what do you make of this? No, I think it's a phenomenal deal. I mean, they get two years, only $5.2 million. That surprised me how cheap of a deal it was uh, in terms of contracts, obviously. Um, but, no, th- this gives the Sixers a lot more depth as well. You- you've already had a solid offseason bringing in some other guys, but this gives you a guy when Embiid needs rest, you can rest Embiid. Get a guy that's been in the league for a while. It's been 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 through the journey. Get get a guy to, to start, help the team, uh, maybe rest and beat an extra game or two throughout the regular season, so he, he's healthier and more ready to go for the playoffs. And one of the biggest things Embiid talked about in the off season, or after getting eliminated, getting ready for the off season, was how the team had to grow and, and get tougher. And that's what the Sixers did all this off season. You look at some of the signings. You bring in a guy like PJ Tucker, and now you bring in a guy like Harrell, and, and you bring in two tough guys there off free agency, and then obviously you hope for the rest from the rest of the team to grow as a unit as well. But no, I mean as a six, like this couldn't be a better deal for the Sixers. I agree. I mean, for a Sixers team that struggled, you know, the article here mentioning 28th in bench scoring last year, you need all the depth you can get. I will always preach that depth is the most important thing in the NBA, not the star talent you have. You have to have a great bench. That was something Philadelphia struggled with. This is a good signing for them. I agree. I love this signing for them. Get a guy who can go in there, score, rebound, play when he needs to. Just an overall solid guy. No, exactly, and I like how they did two years here because you lost Drummond, obviously one trading him, but he was on a one-year deal anyway. So this one's two years. You can find the backup you really like, like they did in Drummond, and, and yeah, now you go from here. I do think it's funny um, between Harold playing for Doc Rivers, I'm pretty sure he played for the Rockets as well. It's funny that what Daryl uh, Daryl Morey's doing with, with building the old Rockets team, literally too. just the Rockets with Embiid. <laughs> no Chris Paul but yeah. this time. You Rockets Embiid. with Embiid and Tobias Harris. There you go. What a team. What an absolutely interesting team. But we have a little bit more to talk about non-basketball-wise. We do have the official first AP poll to come out after a week. Not the preseason poll. This is our second AP poll. Alabama, to the surprise of absolutely no one, still number one. Georgia, though, moving right up to number two behind them, getting some votes away from the Crimson Tide. And that happens when you beat Oregon 49-3. to You're going to turn some heads there. And then Ohio State falling after their win over Notre Dame. Not the Ohio State a lot of people expected to see. Michigan, Clemson, A&M, Oklahoma, Notre Dame, Baylor, USC rounding out that top 10. Oklahoma State moving up as well to 11. The big one, Florida jumping up to 12 after their win over Utah. The Utes falling to 13. 
And then Michigan State, Miami rounding out the top 15. And Arkansas, Pitt, NC State, Wisconsin, Kentucky, BYU, Ole Miss, Wake, Tennessee, and Houston are in the top 25. So, Andrew, what is your main takeaway from this? One, as usual, like the extra reward teams for a big win. I mean, I got no problem with Florida being ranked, but they should not have went from unranked to 12. Or you severely underseeded them uh, before the year. Um, I mean, what did they do in that win? I mean, obviously, obviously it was a good win, don't get me wrong. But, I mean, it wasn't like they blew them out. It was a close game. Um, Arkansas beat a ranked team. Um, you had... I mean, I don't know. I think the main takeaway from that almost is they're like, oh, they just beat Utah. We need to find a way to get them in front of Utah, but they didn't want to move Utah any farther down than 13. So, like, oh, that's a good spot for them. But, I mean, honestly, if I was doing this, Georgia would get my vote for first. I mean, you're coming off, obviously, a championship season. I get it. They lost a lot of that defense, and everyone was talking about it. You lose your D.C. and everything. But what do they do? All they do is go beat a ranked a top 15 team by 46 points and only give up three. Like, I'm sorry. I'm, again, nothing against Alabama. I mean, they I mean they might go out and win every game this year. But, I mean, Georgia, all they did, I mean, all you hear about all season, oh, can their defense do it? Can their defense do it? Tough game to start with. You got, you're got playing your former coordinator and everything, and they went out and demolished them. I mean, it wasn't even like it was close at any point in that game outside of kickoff. Um, so, I would honestly personally put Georgia at one just because of that. I have no problem keeping Alabama at two. I got no problem with Ohio State jumping. I think a lot of people will look at that as how did they drop because they beat a top five team. But I think that's just rewarding Georgia for how much they beat a good team. Yeah. Like they won by 46. Ohio State was down at halftime. So, again, it's nothing against Ohio State. It's more because of Georgia's win. I don't know if you'd agree with that because I know a lot of people are going to see that and be like, how do you drop Ohio State? But I think it's because of Georgia's win. I, I agree. I think it's – Well, I think it's also some of Ohio State, the way they played. When they were built up to be this juggernaut of a team that was supposed to beat Notre Dame by 17, Vegas had that as a 17-point spread. A lot of people really thought Notre Dame was overrated. People thought Ohio State, this is their year to really contend. And they come out and not really look impressive for a half, struggle around, have to get their run game going, win it with defense instead of offense. And then you look at what Georgia did. Yeah. I think it's a combination of both, and I think it's well-deserved to have Georgia, too. I agree with you. Georgia probably should be number one. If we're going based on what we've seen so far, Georgia should be number one. However, that's not how the AP poll works. No. That is never how the AP poll has worked. The The other one to me that I guess I find a little odd is keeping Notre Dame at eight. I talked about this earlier in my video today. I think Baylor probably should be put over him, but it's such a minor difference that it's, you know, it's not, it's a minor critique I have. I would like to see Baylor at eight, Notre Dame at nine, but it's, it's one spot. In the end of the day, it really doesn't mean anything. See, I was going to actually swing it the other way. I, I was surprised Notre Dame got a three spot drop because you're winning at halftime. You played Ohio State close. You talked about it. They made Ohio State not look nearly as good as everybody expected them to come out and play. So Notre Dame played, I I get they struggled big time in the second half, but for the most part, they played a fairly well game under first-year head coach for his full season. I know he ended up coaching the bowl game last year. But so to me, I was surprised to see them drop three spots with a loss like that. Um, So I I took it the other way. I was surprised to see that. Especially when you have Utah drop f- only five compared to three spots to an unranked team. So that's where it kind of surprised. NC State won, and they dropped five spots. So to me, there's a little bit of inconsistency here. I, I have no problem Notre Dame staying above Baylor just because Baylor would be an, uh, an Albany, Albany team. Um, it would have been different maybe if they beat a, went out and beat a ranked team, something like that. Um, Clemson dropping a spot to Michigan surprised me. I mean, don't get me wrong, the Clemson looked great throughout most of that game, no. But Michigan beat Colorado State, Clemson beat Georgia Tech. Are they powerhouse teams? No, but they're both kind of respectable in the same range if you think about it. So I, I was surprised to see Michigan jump. I don't know if I like that four spots for a win over Colorado State. I don't know how you feel about that one. Uh, that one to me is more of a kind of everything else happening around them. I think the main storyline we're going to see this entire year is that 4 through 10 range. 
No one has any idea how good any of those teams are. Yeah. We know who our top three are. That's not going to change at all this year unless something catastrophic happens to one of them. That battle of four through ten the entire year, I wouldn't be surprised if we get to, you know, Clemson was four last week. This week it's Michigan. If Michigan doesn't look impressive and A&M or has a big win or something or Baylor looks good, maybe they slide up to four at some point. That's going to be kind of the revolving door spot, I think, this yeah. year. No, I, I agree with that. I agree with that take and everything, and we'll see what happens. Um, this next week, obviously, we got some big games there in terms of some of those teams playing. Um, obviously, Baylor BYU should be fun. Obviously, we'll probably talk about that on a Thursday. I get yeah, a pre- we'll talk preview, about that but on our show. Um, no, there's some good rank rank games here this week, um, this upcoming week, and I think that, that I always think that plays a factor in some of the, where they rank them. I know they'll never admit to that, but I do think it plays a little bit um, to to where they go. And then the uh, other one thing I want to touch on. Oregon just getting completely dropped from 11 to out, just not even in the top 25, getting obliterated off the map, Cincinnati falling out as well. So you look at your first five out, Oregon, Penn State, Texas, Cincinnati, and Florida State. Florida State getting some respect for their win over LSU, and they had to say the line. They had to say Florida State is back. One of their players just had to say it. So we'll, we'll track how those teams do for the rest of the season as well. Yeah, congrats. If you being an unranked team makes you back. Hey, there's, beat, a lot, there's a lot of back teams They beat teams LSU that are back because they blocked a PAT. That's good enough for them. I'll tell you what. I know you guys will touch on here in the next hour, but there are two, two great games that can, week one could be go down as the best games of the year, which is kind of funny. Yeah. That's week one for you. That's all I could say. But the final thing to touch on, before you get out of here and I sit and wait for 30 minutes, I guess is the best way to put it today. MLB standings, as always, our weekly MLB recap. Here's what's going on in baseball. We have to start with the, the big storyline. We've slowly been watching the decline of the New York Yankees this entire second half of the season. It's, it's five games now, folks. It was four the other day. Five games separate the Yankees and the Rays, and five and a half separate the Yankees and the Blue Jays. That is suddenly a tight race. It has just come out of nowhere. It feels like it was eight just a few days ago. The Rays obviously winning that series over the Yankees. That changes everything. Yeah, no, it's going to continue to be a fun battle. We got about 30 games. It's, yeah, I believe one, that'd be 135. Yes, yeah, about. 27 games left in the season. We got about a month to make left. to make five games up. I mean that's doable. Um, that's definitely doable there. I, I think it's it, it's going to be a fun battle. We'll get into the other team that's choking away their division lead here in a little bit. It's funny they're both from the same state, but um, same area too. Yeah, no, but I I, I give credit. And here's the thing: it, it's going to be a fun race. Toronto's playing well too. They they've won five straight. That's just kind of funny. Every team I'm a team creeps closer. The Rays or Blue Jays going a little bit of losing streak, fall another two or three back, and then they make it up. So I, that's what that's going to be the difference is can they maintain this hot stretch uh, for for a change here? But I mean it 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 does help that you know what the difference is here too is you look at other divisions, you look at the Astros, they're gonna have to go up against the A's every once in a while. You look at the Mets and the Braves, they're gonna have to go up against the Nationals here and there. You look at the Cardinals, they get to go against the Pirates here and there. You look at the uh, Dodgers, they get to get to go against the Rockies and Diamondbacks here and there. I get it. They're struggling in terms of what we expected from the Red Sox, but there's really no gimme game there for yeah, the Yankees or the, the Rays. Red Sox. Yeah, your worst team is 67 and 69, and a team that was supposed to be a playoff team this year. Like, there's, like, you know what's funny about that is, Red Sox would be what was that two games out of the division lead if they were yeah. in the AL Central? Like, that's what's funny is is the way those divisions work. But no, that that that's a huge difference here. Is some of these other teams. They have a chance where, okay, we play a bad game, we'll go out and get it. No, you're the Yankees and Rays. You're going out there, and you're just playing solid team after solid team inside your division. So there's really no time to lay off for those guys. There absolutely isn't. And another tight race to talk about in the American League, Cleveland, Minnesota, and Chicago all within two games of each other. Just that one game separates the Guardians and the Twins. We've been talking about this the past two weeks. It, it's just so close between those three. Everyone battling. We talked about the White Sox making a run eventually, and here they are. Same with the Twins. And the Guardians still holding on with that game lead. 
Yeah, does anybody want to win this division? I don't know. Like that. I don't <laughs> like, think anyone wants to make the playoffs out of this division. Cleveland goes on a hot streak and say, like, okay, here we go. We're going to finally see who's going to pull away. And then all of a sudden, bam, they lose, they lose, they lose. White Sox, I think before they lost on Sunday, they were on like a seven-game win streak. And now they, they get bounced back with a win yesterday. I'll tell you what, I, I still think I, I got low low expectations from the Twins here on out, but I, I think it's going to come down to Cleveland and Chicago uh, the final week of the season. It probably will. That would not surprise me at all. But, yeah, Cleveland, three of their last ten. Everyone's got at least a 25% chance if you go by That's what's ESPN. crazy, too. And then the non-competitive division, which is weird to say considering how good the Mariners yeah. are this year. The Astros have a commanding 11-game lead over Seattle. But both teams, 99% chance to make the playoffs. Things are still going well for the Mariners. I mean, it sucks when you have the number one team in the league in your division, but, hey, that's baseball sometime. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And the thing with Houston is they're always going to be – I mean, they're, they're, they're just that good of a team. They, they've they lost guys over the years, and they still bounce back there. But I'm just excited, knock on wood, pending some big collapse. Seattle's going to be a fun team to watch. And, I mean, obviously they get overlooked a little bit, lower market here and there, but – and also – Again, because they're in the Astros division, so they have no chance to win the division. Um, but no, they're going to be a dangerous team. I mean, they're built well. They got good starting pitching. They got good hitting. They got veterans. They got young guys. So, no, Seattle's going to be a fun team to watch come October. But, um, yeah, no, it's a shame it couldn't be a closer division. That's what I was hoping for is they'd make a division race. I, th- I think that's what we were all hoping for there. But you move on to the National League. We teased it a little bit earlier. The, the Mets are also – starting to get into that caving position. It's just one game between them and the Braves now. Oh, boy. That's all I can say there. Oh, boy. Well, what's crazy about this one, sorry, I forgot to bring it up. Let me see if I can find it real quick as we continue to go through the standings. But I read a stat the other day that was just amazing because it seems like the Mets are, like, on this huge losing drought, like, collapse. But – it's really more about how well the Braves have played over the stretch because um, it was something like the Mets are still in this stretch that the Braves are making up ground. Um, the, Brave, the, the, the Braves are still – the Braves are like 61 and th- I think it was like 30 or something like that in that stretch. And the Mets are just 52 and whatever like that comes yeah. to. And it's just that the – the Braves are just winning that much more. And, and it's funny because, yeah, it seems like the Mets are in this huge collapse. But in, in reality, it's the Braves are just that hot of a team. And that's what – they're going to be dangerous come playoff time, obviously. But, no, I think the Mets are in trouble. I think it's panic time for the Mets. I think they got another big series against each other here in a few weeks. Um, obviously, that will probably most likely decide it. But, no, th- these, these teams – here's the thing. Braves' offense, I think, is a little better than the Mets consistently, and that's where you're going to see a difference. I mean, how many times you see on Twitter or something, DeGrom loses a 2-1, one nothing game. Max Scherzer loses the same way. Where the, I mean, that, that's what it's going to come down to. Is can the Mets' bats uh, re-come alive? Yeah, that's going to be the absolute big deciding point there. Braves have won five in a row. we got to talk about, you know, America's uh, not favorite team this year, but they're just vibing. The Nationals, they, they've won three in a row. What in the world's going on with the Nationals? They beat the Mets, and right. now they beat the Cardinals yesterday. They're they're getting close to that 50-win mark we joked about. They may not even hit. Yeah, all of a sudden, they're going to they're gonna do it, obviously. They'll get 50 at this point, but no, I, I don't know. Washington, Washington minus 200 run differential. That yeah. says it all right there. It really I, does. I, I don't know how... Well, I guess the Pirates got it too. But I don't know how you reach 200. Like, it's just, that's incredible. It absolutely is. I, I don't know how people do it. But looking at the NL Central, the Cardinals now with a seven and a half game lead on the Brewers. They're just continuing to fly away from them. There's really nothing the Brewers can do at this point. They've rebounded a bit now, but usually if the Cardinals win, the Brewers win. If the Cardinals lose, the Brewers lose. They're just kind of keeping just the same path with each other. That's just the most predictable thing since when, – when did we start calling it? Yeah, June, we started June. calling it June, like, yeah. I was like, don't worry, Cardinals are their second-half team. They'll they'll make some small move. Well, it seemed like a small move picking up Montgomery, but, I mean, it turned out to be apparently the greatest move of all yeah. time. But, no, in all seriousness, I mean, we were, we were talking about this 
Brewers always have that collapse. Cardinals always go on a tear. And that's all it is right here. Cardinals, they're just doing their thing in the second half. And the final division to get to, the NL West. What else can you say about the Dodgers? They're 92 and 42, a 19 game lead in their division. Yeah, they're 5 and 5 in their last 10. They're starting to kind of even out a bit. But when you're 50 games above 500, and you're just not even close to anybody. There's really nothing going wrong for the Dodgers, at <laughs> least yet. <laughs> yeah, we'll, just, we'll see if they can pick it up again. I say pick it up. I mean, like, uh, get back to 7-3 and because they were on pace to go right close to the MLB record of 116 wins. And with that 5-5 five and five stretch, it's brought back down to about 113, I think, is they're, they're on pace to get now at this point. So that that's what's going to be really the most intriguing thing to watch for the Dodgers here down the stretch in the last month is can they break the record of 116 wins? Um, that's obviously 15 more wins. You have to go. Well, let's see. They're 92 and 42, so that's 134. So they got 28 games left. So if you got to win, no, excuse me, you have to win 20. Yeah, well, you got to win a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 20 games simple. puts you at 112, so 116 would be 20. Yeah, you'd have to win 25 to break the record. So at this yeah. point, that's probably not going to happen. It's probably not going to happen. So I don't even know how. My goodness, that would be insane if it Cause, happened. Because they were on Sunday Night Baseball against San Diego, and they said they were on pace for 112. That doesn't make sense. They're just expecting them to be that good, Andrew. I guess. They're just expecting that much to happen. But other than that, that will do it for today's show, the first half at least. We will have a second half of the show tonight that will be, of course, uploaded later to YouTube if you're watching this on YouTube. But if you're watching it here on Twitch, at 6 o'clock, we will be back for another show. Myself, Connor Gray, J.D. Eddy will recap all of college football this week, every top 25 team, what they did. We'll talk a little bit more football-related news. I mean, we've got, my goodness, Trubisky's the official starter for the Steelers. We can talk about that later on. So much more to get to, but we're going to turn the stream off for now. We'll come back in about 20 minutes, and until next time, have a good one, everybody.